Hey there. Join me live tomorrow, July 17th from 9.30 a.m. Central until 11 a.m. And this Thursday from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Central live for three 25-minute work sprints with refreshing breaks in between. Folks, check it out. Go to Focused Space. The link is in the description below. Click that link right now. Sign up for your free 30-day trial. Plus, you're going to get 25% off every month after that, all by using the coupon code DAVE. I will be on there live tomorrow and on Thursday. And if you join me now, click the link in the description below. Sign up. It's free for the first 30 days. And then you can use that coupon code if you continue to keep going. And I do encourage you to keep going. And I'm excited. I hope you will join me tomorrow or on Thursday. Sign up now and I'll see you there. Welcome to Wise Squirrels, the podcast for late diagnosed adults with ADHD. I'm your host, Dave Delaney. I'd like to kick off the show today by sharing an email I received from a listener recently. It says, I wonder what you think if any relationship exists with adults with ADHD and imposter syndrome. I've been successful most of my career, but now 46, I seem to be second guessing myself. Have I been a fake all of my life and just happened to be lucky to be around success? I think as an adult with ADHD, it's getting harder to be successful. If not harder, I seem to be more tired. I've always said I need to work twice as hard as my peers, and I'm really tired. Thanks. Look forward to your thoughts. Well, thank you for the email, first of all, and and for opening up. Your vulnerability means a lot. Uh, I'm now 52, and I feel the same way from time to time, so I wanted to preface my comment with that. First thing I'll say is that sharing such thoughts with a therapist is always a great idea. This is how I handle these feelings a lot of the time, and my therapist really does help with this. My understanding is that it's common among wise squirrels to feel this way. In fact, I believe everyone feels imposter syndrome from time to time, and that's not unusual. The fact that you are acknowledging the feelings is a huge plus, though, so good for you for recognizing this. Now, I recommend unplugging, grabbing a journal, and jotting down your feelings. But in addition to this, I recommend writing down your achievements. Focus on the achievements. Make a list of all the achievements you can think of that you've reached in your life so far. And they can be big. They can be small. Like, for example, I've been married. uh, You know, I got married in in, in 2001. So we celebrated our anniversary this year. Uh, You know, another another year passes, you know, my, my son is going off to college. You know, that's a huge success as a parent. um, And my daughter will be, you know, close behind him. So another success. I quit drinking in 2020 and haven't had a drink uh, since. That's a big success. But even small successes too, of just achieving small little things in your life, those are all huge steps forward. I also recommend practicing self-compassion by giving yourself some grace. Uh, you know, I, I often get asked that question about like, you know, what are the biggest changes I've made since being diagnosed with ADHD? And I'll tell you, it's giving myself grace. Now, things like professional development, mentorship, and exercising, these are all very important that you you look into and, and do for yourself. Try stopping comparing yourself to others. You know, this is also a really good idea, and it's something we we all tend to do, but nobody has life sorted out perfectly, I assure you. And uh, oftentimes we use social media to make ourselves seem like, oh, we know it all. And in fact, you know, you don't see those moments of despair. And let me tell you, there are moments of despair for sure. So to that point, I have also found that mindfulness is incredibly helpful and you can learn about mindfulness with a daily meditation practice. Now I have Dr. Zyloska, the author of the mindfulness prescription for adults with ADHD on an upcoming episode. And I really encourage you to watch out for that episode and read her book. I have found it to be incredibly helpful and it's interesting too, because she also has links within the book that go to actual uh, her own 
guided mindfulness meditation practices that you can actually follow along with. So it's a great book. It's called The Mindfulness Prescription for Adult ADHD. Just understand that imposter syndrome is normal and we all go through it. My understanding, as I said, I think at least is that with ADHD, we can we can get more imposter syndrome or heavier bouts of it perhaps. But again, I'm not a doctor. So this is what I recommend you do. This is what I do. And, and talk to your therapist. And if you don't have one, you know, find one, talk to your GP and maybe find a therapist that you can connect with and chat about this stuff. Thanks so much for the question. And if you have questions of your own, don't hesitate to reach out to me at wisequirrels.com or you can email hello at wisequirrels.com. Hey, a quick shout out to Todd, who just became a Patreon supporter. I feel like I need a little bell or something. I've got some plans to deliver bonus content and much more for listeners who go that extra mile. And and really to become a Patreon, you just chip in five bucks a month. It's less than a cup of coffee. And this helps to support the show. It helps to support me. And honestly, when this happens, I feel like, hey, people actually are willing to chip in a few bucks, which means that you're getting a lot of value from this. And I I do appreciate that. To learn more about the Patreon stuff, you can go to wisequirrels.com slash love. Now, if you'd like to sponsor Wise Squirrels, this can also be arranged. A great example is our friends at Focused Space, who have shown their support by offering your first month free and 25% off every month after that by using the coupon code DAVE. So I've got a link on my site, wisequirrels.com slash shine, which will give you more information about this. This will help you with co-working virtually. It will help you with getting support live and completing those most important tasks much faster. And by the way, I want to thank Focus Space for their support. And you can learn more about them at focused.space. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Kathleen Nadeau, who is the founder of the Chesapeake Center, an internationally recognized authority on ADHD. She's a frequent lecturer both in the United States and abroad and provides professional training seminars on topics related to ADHD. Now, Dr. Nadeau is the author or co-author of over a dozen books related to ADHD that address ADHD issues across the lifespan, from her best-selling book for children, Learning to Slow Down and Pay Attention, to her current research and writing for older adults, Hello Wise Squirrels, which is called Still Distracted After All These Years. So let's get in to that interview. You're in Nashville. I didn't know you were in Nashville. Yeah, I've been here 16 years. I'm from uh, Toronto originally, so I moved, moved here by way of Ireland. Wow, that's kind <laughs> of a circuitous route. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, so my wife is from Tennessee, and I met her uh, in Galway, Ireland, on the West Coast there. And uh, we lived abroad for a few years and then moved, uh, moved to, got married, moved to Toronto, and then she did six winters and she's like, yeah, enough of that. And we had two kids and we still have them. They, they survived the winters. huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I've been, I've been really uh, excited to to speak with you and, and thank you for uh, yeah. For all the back and forth this morning or this afternoon. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's, it's worked out and you know, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart because yeah you know, older adults have just been an older, I just mean 55 and up. Yeah. Uh, it's just a population that has received absolutely no attention. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's interesting. What do you know the year offhand? Cause I've been, I've been uh, mentioning this to people lately kind of out and out and about, and I don't know what year adults were able to be diagnosed with ADHD at like, you know, in their adulthood. Cause I know this, it's relatively new, like nineties, right? I think. Yeah. Well, they've, there's always been the rare possibility of diagnosis. Um, you know, even in the eighties and seventies, um, they considered it residual ADHD that most okay. people got over it, but there were a few unfortunate souls that had residual ADHD. So, you know, it, it could be diagnosed, but the only people that were diagnosed in those days were 
outliers, you know, the most yeah. extreme of the extreme and nobody would deny, oh my God, yes, this person still has ADHD. Yeah. But there was an interesting phenomenon and that is that we very mistakenly thought that uh, people outgrew it after adolescence because of a big study that was done in which they only asked the young adults Mm. And young adults with ADHD are not terribly accurate in self-reflection. And many of them didn't like the diagnosis in the first place, felt it had been thrust upon them by teachers and parents, and they were done with it. And so this very inaccurate reporting came out that most people outgrow it. And then when we started looking at parent descriptions of young adults, absolutely, they had not outgrown it. They were uh, struggling with it. And interestingly, a book just came out, co-authored by a wonderful guy who's been in the ADHD field forever, Tony Rustain. He and a woman co-author wrote a book called You're Not Done Yet mm. to Parents about their 20-something offspring with ADHD. You're not done yet. Uh, you uh -huh. really expect them to act like grown-ups, can you? Uh, yeah. So, but you're right. In the mid-90s, um, the book Driven to Distraction came yep. out in 95, and that became sort of an instant bestseller. It was written by Hal Willen Rady. Mm -hmm. And there was just a flood of requests for interviews about adult ADHD. And there were articles in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and you name it. And just all of a sudden coming out of the woodwork. And mm -hmm. as a result of that, a few adult ADHD clinics were created in the 90s. Yeah. And what's fascinating, I mean, first of all, we were denying that adults still had it, and we certainly were denying that females had it. I mean, right, right. And yet, guess what happened when these adult ADHD clinics were formed? The majority of people seeking diagnosis there were female. The yeah. Majority, the majority of adults. And yeah. then they just said, oh, well, we're still very correct that it's primarily a male disorder. And it's just that females are more comfortable seeking mental health services. And that's why there's a skewed, you know, baloney, baloney. But that's uh, yeah, that's where that came from. And you're absolutely right. It was the mid 90s. And here we are all these years later. So almost 30 years later. Yeah. And statistics tell us that here in the U.S. by 2030, which is only six years from now, mm -hmm. there will be more people in the U.S. over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. here is this disorder that we thought was children, okay, children and teenagers, but yeah. we're going to be more older adults. I mean, forget adults. Of course, there are many, many more adults than there are people under age 18. And mm -hmm. so ironically, it's really getting turned on its head that maybe we should talk of it as a disorder of adults over 55 that also affects children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. Because it's interesting, like what I've learned like I was diagnosed last year uh, at 50. So uh, just before my 51st birthday. So it's been, yeah, I mean, I've learned, obviously I learned a ton because of course I started this podcast and jumped right into everything because I, I, that's what I do. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been interesting to learn. Yeah. How, how women girls were pretty much ignored uh, early on because of it being sort of thought of as this naughty boy, hyperactive boy syndrome. Meanwhile, you know, the girls were just as hyperactive, but more possibly in their minds, looking out the window, daydreaming, inattentive more so. Uh, and then, and then women being diagnosed more and more, as, as you were saying, I think also with, with, you know, the, I think it's like something around 80%, right. With hereditary as well. So like so many children, 
re- get diagnosed. And then as the, the parents are treating the child or, you know, they, they start seeing the, sure. the symptoms in themselves and they're like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well, and I think of real ADHD mm. uh, as being hereditary. I mean, mm. there, there are other ways to develop the same set of symptoms that have to do with oxygen deprivation or lead exposure or brain injury. But those yeah. are just insults to the brain that can lead to this set of symptoms. But what I really think of as true ADHD is a type of brain, not a damaged brain, not an injured brain, but just yeah. a type of brain that's really quite common. It is. Yeah. It's, it, it, I know last I heard it was like five to 8% of Americans have ADHD and something like 20% don't know they do. Um, have you heard s- similar statistics to, like around that? Or would you, I mean, I would almost just now knowing what I know being out and about, I'm like, whenever I like, I'll talk to people, I'll be like, Hmm, <laughs> like I I'm like, I'm thinking those numbers are probably a lot more. Well, The thing is, we have always acted as if ADHD was this discrete diagnosis that you either had or you didn't have. Mm. Actually, it exists along a continuum. And like almost everything exists along a continuum. And it's really kind of arbitrary where you draw the line of do you Mm. or don't you have it. And it just seems kind of absurd to me that you have it if you have six symptoms, but you don't have it if you have five symptoms, you know, yeah. I mean, who wrote that rule? Uh, it, it's, it's just completely arbitrary. And yeah. of course, some people are impacted by this type of ADHD brain that they're completely dysfunctional. Uh, but most people with ADHD are not completely dysfunctional and many are actually quite successful in life if they can find the right pathway. Yeah. And I, I, I realize now so much of my own life, career, family, everything, you know, I've developed these coping mechanisms, these coping strategies unknowingly thinking that like, I mean, a lot of the, the things that I've learned about ADHD, I realize. I mean, like everybody has trouble focusing at time from time to time. Not everybody has ADHD from time to time. To be clear, of course, because that's yeah. something I hear a lot. Um, but the fact that like these common traits, if you will, of ADHD are things that I just assumed everybody had at the same level, and so the the strategies I would come up with myself to, to help me get more done in a day or to stay focused on specific tasks or, you know, I almost feel like every productivity expert out there. And I know a few are all probably ADHDers, whether they know it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find that too? Do, like these kind of commonalities with adults with ADHD, like the, the coping mechanisms they've developed over the years, kind of unknowingly or masking without knowing. Well, I mean, they, you knew you were developing coping mechanisms. You just didn't know it was related to something that we call ADHD. Right. And and I really, frankly, think ADHD is a huge misnomer. It's Mm. not a deficit of attention. Mm. It's much more complicated than that. And I imagine you have experienced this in your own life, that this type of brain that we call ADHD is really capable of an intense hyper-focus that most folks are not capable of. Yes. Uh, but it's not, I, what I say is a better description is that it is a dysregulated attentional system. Because sometimes, and I I am an adult with ADHD myself. Yeah. And I did very well in school simply because I liked it. And yeah. we tend to do well at things that we're interested in and like. But I was such a hyper focuser as a kid that one of my grandmothers insisted on having my hearing tested when I was eight years old. 
because I could sit in the middle of a chaotic living room. I was one of four kids with my nose in a book and people would be calling me and I'd have absolutely no idea they were calling me because wow. I was in that book. And and that's just as typical of ADHD as the, yeah. I can't pay attention to this book because I'm not interested in this book. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Yeah, because a lot of people think of like just kind of cliche sort of stereotypes of of ADHD and sort of pop culture or what have you, and they they right away think of that. Um, yeah, I, I, you have a lecture called "The Code of Many Colors." Tell me a little bit about that and sort of the uh, yeah the gist from that. Well, what I really wanted to emphasize there is that ADHD is manifested in many, many different ways. And the, the, the public that doesn't, I mean, why would they be knowledgeable about this thing that even all of us professionals don't fully agree on is that um, the hyperactive, impulsive, naughty, pain in the neck, driving all the adults crazy little boy, that's the stereotype, is just one way that it is manifested yeah. and there are so many different issues that we lump under executive functioning issues uh, which really has to do with self-management issues but not all of us have the same self-management issues like yeah. just speaking of myself I don't have any emotional regulation issues I'm not short-tempered I'm not easily frustrated I'm not anxious i i'm you know i'm not but yeah. in terms of tracking time for example that's one of my biggest challenges mm. is that i just get so engrossed in what i'm doing or distracted yeah what i'm doing that the passage of time just feels very slippery to me yeah. like when I was waiting to get the email from you, just as a, for example, yeah, I'm on my email, of course, waiting to get the link. Yeah. And I really had to argue with myself to stop myself from opening other emails. Well, I can make use of this time. And I knew that if I opened one of them, you know, then I wouldn't see your email. When it came in. <laughs> right, right, right. That's so, interesting. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you sort of, have you put in like other like what are some other ways or maybe common things that you see like techniques or, or tactics? And I, again, I mean, it, it, it shows differently, but there are obviously commonalities. I mean, it is an acronym after all, but um, uh, as far as like what adults can do who have ADHD to, to help them sort of like, like the example you just gave of like, okay, I know I'm going to get distracted by open another email. So like, don't do that. Like I show up, like if I have a meeting, for example, somewhere, I always show up like 30 minutes, even an hour early. I, I don't show up and I'm not rude about it. Like I'll, I'll, you know, I'll sit in the car or what have you, but um, I'm curious about some of the, the strategies or common things that you see there. And you do that. You arrive an hour early to be sure you're not late. Yes. Because the reason I'm um, asking is that because of ADHD distractibility, very often arriving really early is a bad tactic unless mm. you're going into an environment where you're captive, basically. Like, yeah, I wouldn't advise somebody to get there an hour early and sit in your car because you're going to go on your phone. You're going to start listening to the radio. You're going to, Oh, yeah. I'll go across the street and get a cup of coffee. I mean, you're going to, you'll have too much time to get distracted. Yeah. You're, now, if you're sitting in a dentist's office an hour early, that's not going to happen. I mean, you're a captive audience and they're going to yes. come get you. But I think that we really have to manage our brains and distraction that we will find if, um, in fact, I've been in any number of conversations where people say I've sort of figured out exactly how much advance warning I need. Like if I need to leave the house, yeah. like a seven minute warning is perfect 
if I give myself a 10 minute warning, then I might think I had time to do just one more thing and I'm late. Yes. I'll do one more thing and not gather together, you know, my wallet, my phone, my keys. And so I'm still late. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So we need to not give ourselves too much time to get lost in the ether. But, Mm. But going back to this code of many colors, one of the reasons why ADHD is a code of many colors is that I really believe that this thing we call ADHD, and I I call it a type of brain, I don't think Mm. as a disability, I don't don't think of it as a gift, I think of it as a type of brain that has advantages and challenges, like, like all brains do. But ADHD has, I believe, more psychiatric comorbidities than any other disorder. And in fact, the psychologist, he used to be at Yale for many years, Tom Brown, now he's retired and living in California, but he wrote about that and called ADHD as a foundational disorder, meaning that he believed that it made you more vulnerable to other disorders. I mean, one mm-hmm. of the things that we know genetically is there seems to be a genetic cluster that contains ADHD, anxiety, depression, and addictive tendencies. Yes. And and one can inherit that whole cluster yeah. or any part of it. Yeah, uh, and I dab, uh, yeah, and I certainly have experienced all of the above. I mean, I I uh, uh, depression to a lesser degree, but certainly anxiety. I mean, I was being treated for anxiety before my diagnosis. And, um, and when I was working with my doctor on, on some, some medication, um, we actually paused after several months, we paused all the, all the, the different stimulants and doses we were experimenting with to see what was a good fit for me and decided, hold on, let's treat the anxiety and get that in a better shape and then reintroduce the stimulants. And that seemed to work much better for me. So, um, yeah, cause I, and I have learned that like anxiety, especially anxiety and depression being comorbidities of ADHD. And I know, uh, I was, I, the, the thing that's really stood out to me that I learned recently from Russell Barkley was about, um, life expectancy be life expectancy being up to 13 years less for those undiagnosed and untreated um, because possibly up to that much yeah. because of these, these underlying things. And he was talking about how like you can treat anxiety, but for an ADHD or um, you got to get back to the root cause and treat the ADHD as well, or you're, it's just going to continue. Same with like addiction and things like that. Like if you're an alcoholic, let's say, and you're being treated for that, if the ADHD is there, the ADHD needs to be treated as well as the alcoholism. Does that make sense? To me? Sure it does. Although yeah. getting back to the code of many colors, there, yes. there's also a large group of people for whom their anxiety greatly decreases once they're on stimulants because the anxiety was really being caused by the ADHD. In your case, you're talking about uh, another disorder and they're mutually influencing each other. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not always the case. And yeah. I, I remember a quote uh, that I thought was so descriptive when I was interviewing all the older adults I interviewed for my book Yeah, and was a gentleman that said, for me, ADHD is like boxing with an invisible opponent and you don't mm-hmm. know where they are and you don't know where they're going to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. I always, yeah. Uh, I always say, yeah, my metaphor is, uh, is the wrong operating system. So like, I'm like running an app, I'm like an Apple device, like a great device, but I'm running Android operating system. So like it works, some things work fine. Everything's okay. And then other things are like really sluggish and slow, or sometimes I crash. (laughs) What is your uh, profession these days when you're not doing podcasts? I'm a, 
really an expert in communications strategy and skills. So I've worked in marketing and communications and promotions roles, but then I, I discovered public speaking about 15 years ago. And I wrote a book called New Business Networking, all about networking, growing your business and career by using online and offline methods. Because I love people. I love meeting people. I love performance and and delivering presentations. I have a background with improv comedy as well. And, and so all of these things I've realized, like I'm obviously I'm extroverted, um, but I'm very highly creative and I love I love being with people and I work from home, which sucks most of the time because like I was just in San Diego for uh, a speaking engagement and my wife's always like, yeah, you need to get out of the house to go talk to people more because that's, that's your happy place. And, uh-huh. Uh-huh. and, and, and I've realized by the way, in, in my own research and studying about ADHD in this podcast and things that as a public speaker standing on stages or doing improv or what have you. When I'm on stages in front of audiences and they're laughing and responding, I'm getting this huge rush of dopamine sure. and I'm like, ah, that's my happy place. That's why I love it so much. And I've learned this. Yes. And interestingly, my uh, daughter, who also has ADHD, uh, did improv and was just ah. great at it. I mean, that's that's a perfect match for the ADHD brain. Ah, you know. Something yeah. to bounce off of. And yeah. if you think about it, I've worked with so many students that have had enormous difficulty writing papers. You know, here's an assignment, write a five page paper on Henry VIII or whatever. Yeah. And they're, they're looking at a blank page. There's nothing to bounce off of. Mm. But you give an ADHD brain something to look at, you know, they're going to riff off of it, disagree with it, add to it, what, whatever, you know, they've yeah. got something to respond to. And our brains are very responsive. Like I used to say, if I had to play trivial pursuit for a living, I would starve to death because right. that is, there's one answer, there's one answer only, and you have to sort around in that jumbled filing cabinet in your mind to find the one answer. Yeah. But if you give me a topic, I could talk to you about it for hours. That's because, interesting. Yeah. That sounds familiar to me too, actually, because yeah, I've always hated trivia games like that with single answers, but I could play name that tune. No problem. Right. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. Are, what are some of the differences you see? Because obviously women have really gotten the short end of the stick as far as ADHD diagnosis, because of whether it was just a misunderstanding or misogyny or whatever was uh, causing the lack of diagnosis for girls, especially, uh, back in the day, but what are, yeah, what are some differences with among the, the genders with, or, or more for, for women when it comes to ADHD? Well, I think, I think there are multiple reasons why girls and women go underdiagnosed. I mean, part of it is, change happens so slowly in the medical world and mm. they defined it in a particular way and all the research that was done was based on that definition and so nobody going so oops we were completely wrong and so all that research is biased and you know to yeah. be disputed. so that they're so we are dragging that legacy forward very slowly admitting that yes i guess adults have it too and we we're sort of getting that far but we we haven't yet developed criteria appropriate for adults we just tried to tweak the criteria that we dealt developed looking at little boys so that yeah. and forget it about females we weren't looking at female girls so we don't have that legacy in terms of diagnosing women. So part of it is just the mindset that, and if you go out into the general public, that's the stereotype. It's a hyperactive, misbehaving little boy. Mm-hmm. And I think what happens is in childhood, it's the adults that define what's going on. It's not the child. Mm. 
And so little boys were driving a lot more adults crazy. Yeah. Teachers and parents were going, what am I going to do with this kid? You know, he won't yeah. listen. He won't sit down. He won't do this. He won't, you know. And that's not true for females. Um, we weren't driving everybody crazy. I mean, if you'd ask my parents, I was the perfect child. I had my nose in a book. I made good grades. I did what I was asked to do. I had a younger brother who was just the classic hyperactive boy. And they, he, yeah. Richard has it. Look at him. Boy, does he have it. Right. Uh, you know, he was hot tempered. He was loud. He was impulsive. He hated school. He, you know, strong willed, you name it. Yeah. And so the way nobody knew what was going on between my ears. And mm -hmm. I would have known what to tell them had they asked me. Yeah. Uh, and so ADHD in females is a much more internalized disorder. Mm -hmm. And so years ago, when Pat Quinn and I wrote the book, Understanding Girls with ADHD, we yeah. developed question lists. Ask your daughter X if they're in elementary school. Ask them Y if they're in middle school. Let them tell you about their experience. And the experiences are very different. Um, mm -hmm. Number one, girls in general are less active. I mean, just if you just look at kids on a playground, girls yeah. are less physically active. They are less oppositional. Um, Howard Abacoff did a classroom study of girls and boys with ADHD years ago. And what he found in classroom observation is that girls never argued with the teacher or yeah. got mad at the teacher, they might argue with a peer. They might be very verbally aggressive with a peer. Somebody hurt their feelings or made them angry. Yeah. Not with the adults. Not huh. with the adults. Yeah, uh, interesting. And there are there are a very few girls who are oppositional and loud and aggressive, but it's such a tiny percentage. That's not what the, the girls look like. And we know that girls are much more likely to feel anxiety because they know they're having trouble keeping up with things and kind of frantically, where did I put my homework? And, oh, my gosh, I forgot my lunch and my mom's going to be so mad at me. And, you know, just all this anxiety about yeah. their ADHD. And so they get diagnosed with anxiety. We know what's right. going on. She's anxious. Look at her. Yeah. She's so anxious. Uh, not understanding that that anxiety is the result of I'm really having trouble managing my life. Yeah. And, and to this day, I have to check and recheck and recheck. For example, this morning, I told my husband that I had this podcast at 2 p.m. Mm. That's where it was in my mind. Right. And I know myself, so I have to keep going back to my calendar. Said, so, "Oh, I'm so sorry. No, it's at 1 p.m." So. <laughs> I do that too. I like, I, yeah, I live and die by my calendar. Like, if it's not on my calendar, it it doesn't happen, and I check it multiple times. I'm always like double, triple checking things. Um, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's a big one. Um, as, as far as like executive functioning or executive functioning skills or executive function, um, one thing that I've noticed, and I know. You know, we we kind of talked a little bit about how sort of the it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a pickle with like the DSM five not including things or being very slow to 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 innovate or to update things and and it's like so many professionals, medical professionals like yourself, like know specific things, but because they're not in the DSM five yet, then it's it's a bit of a pickle that way. Um, but I had two questions there. One is around uh well let me go with executive functioning skills so i follow like dr brown's uh, uh kind of ex explanation of of uh these but there isn't really my understanding at least is that there isn't really any consistent there are there are like some categories five or six categories i guess of executive functioning skills but nothing that's like concrete like is that right like it's not included in the dsm5 or am i messing all this yeah. up well, you're you're sort of asking me a whole lot of questions. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but that they're all pertinent. The mm. 
the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual absolutely does not address executive functioning skills because that's a new concept that didn't make it into the DSM. Right. And so, and everyone in the field, everyone knows, believes, operates as if executive functioning challenges are the underlying set of challenges uh, experienced by people with ADHD, but you will not find that in the DSM. Yeah. That's how slow they are to change. So you, if you, you mentioned Russ Barkley, he certainly has defined ADHD in terms of executive functioning skills. Mm. And when you say, is there a definitive list of executive functioning skills, you'll find sometimes five listed uh, as in Tom Brown's ADD scale, sometimes you'll find eight functions listed. Right. Uh, basically, executive functioning skills are self-management skills and also the skills we need to accomplish what we want to set out to accomplish. Mm. And, of course, there are n- enormous number of skills involved in getting from an idea to a reality. Right. And all of those are different types of executive functioning skills. And they all have different names depending on who you're talking to, even though a lot of the times you're we're, like short term memory and working memory, I believe, are the same. Right. Like or, or similar, at least like a lot of a lot of the, you know, time management skills versus punctuality versus, you know, like a lot of the things have the same name or similar. It's a similar gist, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. and I don't pay much attention to what exactly are you calling it because I, I have an overarching concept of what are the executive functioning skills of the brain. And we know mm-hmm. that those are higher order cognitive skills. They take place in the prefrontal lobes of the brain. Yeah, Those skills are the skills that we associate with maturity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in ADHD, we know that our prefrontal lobes develop more slowly and that yeah. they are underactive because of lower dopamine levels. So yeah. we, we're always telling parents, subtract three years. If you've got an 18 year old, they have a 15 year old brain that they're operating with You know, mm-hmm. talking about operating systems. And, yeah. you know, I've known, I, I have been in this field for so long that I have, I feel like I've sort of raised two generations, at least, of people with ADHD and people that are wildly dysfunctional at age 18 may actually learn to be pretty darn functional by the time they're 35. Yeah. And I remember working with a guy years ago who was the black sheep of his highly uh, high achieving, highly successful family. And he was doing drugs in high school and skipping class and blah, blah, blah. And Mm -hmm. everybody else, all his siblings went off to very competitive schools. And he went to the local community college, immediately got his girlfriend pregnant. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, every parent's like, oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. He put himself in both feet simultaneously. And so that's what was going on in his life when he was 18 or 19 years old. But I didn't meet him until his wonderful son, the product of that very unplanned pregnancy, uh, Mm. walked into my office 10 years later. And his parents long since divorced. uh, And so this little fellow comes into my office. By the way, he's a middle-aged man now, and he's a very successful cartoonist. Oh, wow. Nice. Uh, Yeah, very cute kid. But he came in, and I diagnosed him with ADHD. And a couple of weeks later, I get a call, and it's his dad saying, you just diagnosed my son, and I think I have it too. Can I come see you? Oh, wow. Right. So the, it, now uh, it's like 28, 29 years old, divorced, hasn't finished college, struggling financially, has this 10 year old he's concerned about. And yeah. so I worked with him for quite a few years. 
And Mm -hmm. when he was diagnosed and went on medication, he went back to community college. His brain was able to do it then. He got an associate's degree. He went to a four-year school. He got his bachelor's degree. He was in technology. He got a good job, you know, and I wouldn't hear from him for two or three years. And then he'd say, hey, doc, I want to talk to you. This is what's going on. Yeah. I helped him sort of communicate with his bosses about meetings drive me out of my mind and I can't listen anyway. And that his boss says, well, you're a great employee. And if I'm going to get more work out of you by keeping you out of meetings, then by God, don't come to the meetings. Hey, that's great. Yeah, he went back and got a master's degree. He married, uh, this time very thoughtfully and appropriately. And yeah. so by the time he was 40, he was a very functional, successful guy. And mm-hmm. some people would say, well, he doesn't have ADHD anymore. And I say baloney, that yeah. his brain grew up. He he picked a field that he was very well suited for. He had supports around him. He had created an environment in which he could function. Yeah. My understanding too, and that's that's fantastic. I mean, I love I love hearing that. It, it for for adults with uh to receive an ADHD diagnosis, my understanding is that like they have to tick or the doctor has to tick enough boxes around topics like how your life is being sort of disrupted and, and like any, sorry about my thumb keeps every time I talk with my hands, something about ADHD, I think. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, What are your thoughts with that? As far as like, yeah, these, these types of uh, these types of things. Well, I think that's ridiculous. Yes. I I think we are sort of conflating diagnosis and disability. Mm. Um, Everyone with ADHD isn't disabled by their ADHD. And Mm -hmm. my job as a psychologist that specializes in is to help people not be disabled by their ADHD. Am I curing them of ADHD? I I haven't changed their brain. I help them understand how to manage their brain. I, I have this concept that I call planting yourself in the right garden. Hmm. Uh, And there is an Eastern philosopher who, and I think it's a great metaphor, if a plant is struggling, you don't blame the plant. You decide, does it need more water? Does it need fertilizer? Is it getting enough sunlight? Is it in the wrong climate? You need to plant it in the place where it can thrive. And that's the metaphor I use with all the people that I work with, that all people with ADHD don't thrive in the same place. Yeah. Um, we, we're all unique individuals with lots of other things going on in our brains, yeah. in our lives. But a big, big part of my job is to help people understand the environment in which they're going to thrive. And I got so frustrated with this idea of, well, look, you don't have ADHD anymore. Uh, yeah. And I had this big public debate with another ADHD expert who would not diagnose a young woman with ADHD who had had ADHD because she graduated from college. She had a functional romantic relationship. She had a job, she had a life. So we can't diagnose her with ADHD anymore. And so I wrote this very tongue in cheek article, uh, Mm. good news parents. If your child graduates from college, they won't have ADHD anymore. (laughs) <laughs> all you got to do is get them there and they don't have it anymore but sure. oops, they couldn't find a job i guess they caught it again oh they have a job i guess they don't have it again they got fired oops i guess they got it again you know like it's a virus yeah. or something i mean it's yeah. it's an absurd notion because it is a type of brain uh and i think that In a funny way, I think we are the victims of our Puritan heritage here in the U.S. Mm. And a lot of people 
uh, don't have ADHD can be very judgmental, judgy, judgy about ADHD. And not mm. only that, but they can be very judgmental about taking stimulants, taking performance enhancing drugs. <laughs> How dare you want to enhance your performance? It should be yeah. pure grit and hard work. Um, and so I read all these articles that just oh, make me cringe about people trying to convince people they have ADHD to get these performance enhancing drugs. Well, you know, give me a break. Coffee gives me a performance enhancement. Cigarettes yes. are so addictive because they're performance enhancing. Food yeah. is fairly performance enhancing too, as yeah. it's sleep. I mean, all of these things are really dangerous. Yeah. Um, so- what? It's interesting too, because like I, um, on, excuse me on that point, like I, I feel like when I talk to some people they think, I think partly because of like the controversy around like, uh, Oxycontin and sort of the, the overprescribing of so many people there. Um, and then, but I don't know enough about Ritalin and the eighties and seventies when, and and maybe you can speak to this a bit. We're, we're like, and I've never really researched it, so I don't know. Was Ritalin like overprescribed? Were people being like children, especially naughty boys? I guess were they being like overly diagnosed or overly medicated on Ritalin back in the eighties or so? Or was that no. just no? They were not. And okay. I deal with this question all the time. Mm -hmm. And if anything, we continue to under diagnose ADHD. Right. There's an interesting phenomenon. A battle took place maybe in the 70s. Mm. I'm not sure of my dates here between the Church of Scientology and the American Psychiatric Association. Mm. Because the American Psychiatric Association started claiming basically that Scientologists were sort of practicing what they deemed to be psychotherapy without a license, that they were doing things they were not trained to do. And in many cases, they felt they were causing damage. Mm -hmm. So the Church of Scientology retaliated very consciously and ferociously by vilifying Ritalin. Oh, interesting. Yes. It was, I mean, what does Ritalin have to do with, you know, APA trying yeah. to put them out of the therapy business? But that's huh. where they came back. That's and fascinating. They started inventing insane stories. I remember some story about some child on Ritalin jumped off a bridge to his death. I mean, it's just absurd stories. Mm. Uh, and a lot of parents were terrified of putting their child on this awful drug. I was living in Europe in the mid nineties. And I remember one of the very popular French um, weekly magazines had a picture of a giant Ritalin pill on the cover yeah. uh, and, and it said obedience pills. And it was ah. all an article about American parents don't know how to raise children. And so they give them obedience pills. Mm. Um, and I was there uh, living there for over a year in the mid nineties and American parents would come up to me saying, my child is suffering in school here they don't recognize ADHD. They use public humiliation and shame for mm. behavior control in the classroom. Um, so it was, it's, it's interesting. interesting. I mean, that we look at everything through a cultural lens. Right. And in France, they, they were not looking at neurodevelopment. I mean, they their version of psychiatry was Freudian still. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too, because like you, um, like I've heard like in Japan, for example, you, they, they don't prescribe stimulants oh. at all. And in fact, if I, my understanding at least is that if you go to Japan, you can't even legally bring stimulants with you. At least the last I heard, I don't know if that's still accurate or not. Um, 
but yeah, no, it's it, so I was, I'm Canadian, <laughs> excuse me. Well, I'm a Canarican now, I guess, cause I'm a naturalized American, yeah. but, um, as a Canadian growing up, you know, uh, advertising drugs on TV was illegal. And in the States, it's always been the case. And so I have family members who like know every drug under the sun because they, and they've probably taken them, um, to some extent. And, uh, I, I say this because like, I was very, every time I go to the doctor or nurse, you know, I was sick, I had a flu or cold or whatever the, the nurse would always say like, what, what medication are you on? And I'd say, oh, I'm not on anything. And then they'd be like, no, no, what, what drugs are you prescribed to? And I'd be like, nothing, I'm not on anything. And they would always be flabbergasted an American that's not on any prescriptions. And then, and then as soon as I get naturalized last year. I get diagnosed and damn it. Now they got me. I'm on stimulants and anti-anxiety <laughs> meds. So I'm like, they got me. Um, now you're a true American. You're, now <laughs> you've got ADHD. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, you know, the cultural, I've started doing more and more thinking and writing about mm. this because all behavior exists in a cultural context. Yes. And if anything, I think the U.S. is a particularly good place to have an ADHD brain. And the mm. reason I say that is we have many more degrees of freedom to reinvent ourselves here in the States. I mean, it's just yeah. it's just kind of a normal thing to do. Right. And I remember living in France that, I mean, they had a saying in France that ideally your children are on the rails sur les rails. And that mm. meant they're on track and they're just going to stay on that track. And, yeah. and it, it was just unheard of to change your college major, to change your career, to, you no, know, you decide what you're going to do. And that's how you spend your life. And that yeah. is very poor for someone with ADHD, whereas here we really um, understand that there are huge benefits. I mean, the number of people with ADHD that are entrepreneurs is much higher than in the general population because it's very compatible. Yeah. You have to have ideas. Idea generation is an ADHD trait. You have to be a risk taker. You need to be restless. You want stimulation and you're going to go out there and start something. And yes. Yeah. 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 I have and, a, I have a, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go no, on. That's okay. I was just going to say, I have a presentation I'm doing called the root down and it's my next book that I'm working on now because it's very much about my own diagnosis with ADHD and what I've learned, but also it's about um, like I just did this presentation for a group of entre entrepreneurs because you know, it, it's like, yeah, you're 60 to 80% uh, more likely to have entrepreneurial intentions and nearly a hundred percent more likely to start a business with ADHD. So yes. Uh, yeah. I, that's why I was like getting excited when you were saying that. Cause it's, yes. Spot on. I'm just aware of the time and we've got to yes. stop yeah. in a minute. Yeah. But before we do, in great contrast to the U.S., where um, I think there's some positive aspects to the Wild West, there are also, as we all know, uh, some very negative aspects to the Wild West. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I was in Switzerland a number of years ago to talk at a number of private schools how do we deal with this thing called ADHD? Because they just didn't and they had no training. Mm. The day before, I went a day early to get a little less jet lagged and I go in the cultural museum in Zurich, walk in the front door and there are the values of Switzerland emblazoned on the wall. Yeah. And I said, this is so perfect. This is why it's so hard to have ADHD in Switzerland. The uh, acronym that I created is PPOD. Mm. Precision, what? punctuality, order, and discipline. Those are the four values of the country of Switzerland, the watchmakers. Precision, yes. Punctuality. And Japan, very similar. I spoke at the very first ADHD conference in Japan, and mm. I came back and said, I've never felt like a rock star in my life until I go to Japan. I was literally mobbed by Japanese women saying, please help, 
please help. Please help. Wow. There's, no one here. There's no one here to help us. That's amazing. Yeah, we should be very thankful. On that note, I'm very thankful for you to spending your time and insights. This has been amazing. How can people get a hold of you, learn more about what you do? Uh, we didn't even get into talking about all your, your 15 books. Uh, a lot of books. This. Well, as you can tell, I like to write. Yes. Um, so people can learn more about me and my center and my books and everything by going to the Chesapeake Center.com. That's the name of my clinic. The Chesapeake Center, and we are absolutely dedicated to helping people of all ages with this type of brain we call ADHD. (laughs) Thanks a million. This has been so much fun, Kathleen. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, if you liked what you heard today, would you do me a favor? Would you visit wisequirrels.com slash love? That's where you'll find links to become a Patreon by supporting the show. You can advertise on the show. You can also record an audio comment, question, or even email me a question that I can include in an upcoming episode. And you can even leave a little review to let me know how I'm doing. There's more there, wisequirrels.com slash love.